My name is Dr. Uh, Kamal Malakal. I'm a professor of clinical oncology, and I've been working as an oncologist for nearly 50 years. I started my training in Oxford and at uh, the Royal Postgraduate Medical School in London. And then I worked there in, in the Hammersmith Hospital and then uh, Cancer Care in Manitoba, then the Harvard Medical School, and then many other places I've worked in a very senior position. So when we train, how do we manage? So in current cancer treatment, this is quite well practiced. Either we want single modality, like either radiotherapy or surgery, or one single drug, or single modalities, like combinations, and single with multiple drugs, like CMF, for example. In multiple modality, means one single agent, either radiotherapy and hormone or radiotherapy and surgery or surgery radiotherapy when we use multiple combination, multiple modalities, combination agents like surgery, radiation and cyclical chemotherapy. So these are the various ways we treat cancer nowadays. The, the treatment can be given sequentially as multiple single agents, like CMF, for example, or concurrent application of multiple single agents at the same time, like radiotherapy and cisplatinum. And new adjuvant treatment is given when the treatment is given, cancer treatment is given prior to um, primary treatment, like before surgery or even before radiotherapy, you give chemotherapy, or before surgery, you give chemotherapy or radiation. And adjuvant treatment is after you're done the primary treatment, then we add something more <coughs> to reduce the, to reduce the uh, recurrence of spread. That's called adjuvant treatment. We use adjuvant treatment for chemotherapy with chemotherapy or radiation or immunotherapy nowadays. The surgery is spectrum uses. Surgery used, surgery concurrent with primary for surgery, like a small T1 breast cancer can be treated with surgery only. Most of the early uh, skin cancer can be treated, a lot of T1 cancer can be treated primarily with surgery. Uh, that is well documented. And then we use surgery concurrent chemotherapy. And during and after surgery, we give chemotherapy to enhance or enhance the effect of surgery or reduce the uh, recurrence rate or spread. And also, it is with surgery, and we get we give radiation before or after, and also with surgery, radiation with hormone treatment is also added. And then surgery with adjuvant, I explain what is adjuvant, radiotherapy and adjuvant, and chemotherapy. These are the way the spect high surgery is added to adjuvant, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and other systemic treatment. Radiotherapy can be treated as a primary, can be used as a primary treatment. Radiotherapy can be used as a primary treatment for curative treatment, for palliative treatment, and also for adjuvant radiotherapy. Primary radiotherapy is used for, nowadays we know that for a small prostate cancer can be treated uh, primarily with radiation. Skin cancers, uh, cervical cancer, even breast cancer, all those things, T1 cancer, which can be cured by surgery, mostly can be cured and controlled by primary radiotherapy. And curative treatment, it is, we saw, as I said, that some of the radiotherapy can be used primarily for, as a curative without anything. And also uh, with, with some, something else, a regimen treatment, and also for palliative to control symptoms. And also radiotherapy is used as a regimen treatment like before and after surgery, or after surgery mostly and with and out, uh, with chemotherapy, up before and after, up before and after. Same, so chemotherapy is all can be used for primary treatment, or cure, like multiple myeloma, for example, or lymphomas, uh, hematopoietic diseases, and it is used as adjuvant to radiation or surgery, and also chemotherapy used for palliative or symptom control. Symptom control is 
uh, we have, we use it, but palliative chemotherapy is a kind of last resort we try because of the complications associated with palliative chemotherapy, but it is used. Sometimes we've got no other choice, but we do use chemotherapy as a result to control symptoms for patients with advanced diseases. Immunotherapy is still a testing phase. We're still swimming, we do not know exactly where it is. It's a fast growing list of agents that thing. The role of efficacy is still being determined. So far we know that most of the chemotherapy agents which have been passed by FDA or the new have very high toxicity level and we're also still understanding and learning about toxicity. The, re the relative place of cancer treatment of chemotherapy is still being determined. We're not quite sure whether immunotherapy can be used primarily or adjuvant as a, a new adjuvant. We're still wondering what is the best, but we are getting there. We still we understand uh, the real place of immunotherapy, where exactly we should plug it in and where it is. But still, we're a long way away from really understanding exactly what and which and how and when the immunotherapy can be used. And it's a complex process. Interaction with other agents are poorly understood, you do not know much about it. But I must emphasize that this line of action has got a huge potential when you start to understand. And within the next five to 10 years, we'll learn a lot more about the immune reactions, tumor, body's immune reaction. And it is actually, I must tell, say that the COVID-19 has actually made us understand the body's immunity and immune reaction significantly much better. And we can use those knowledges to use cancer immunotherapy for treatment. And as I said, this has got enormous possibility. Is at present, immunotherapy for cancer treatment is really prohibitive, even in advanced countries. I had difficulty in finding money in North America or even in Canada to give the entire course. And it is a complex science, we still don't understand. And it is not really the immunotherapy what we tend to understand, what we taught in medical school, what immunity is and how the vaccines works. So it is really still in a very, uh, very much developing process and we're still understanding and learning more about it almost daily basis. See, so, unlike I, I said, on, on the signal is immunotherapy, the cancer immunotherapy is a complex. The long-term effects are still, we're discovering, we're still trying to understanding and trying to understand. And we're still trying to find out whether immunotherapy can be used as, as a radio sensitizer and or the chemo, chemo sensitizer or can augment as anti-cancer effect of hypothermia. And this is the first time I'm using hypothermia. Hypothermia is not an oncolytic, it is, but I will talk about it. And I brought the hypothermia in the cancer treatment armamentarium as an essential part in my vision now that we should really uh, include hypothermia with all the other things, three things we have done so far. Whether immunotherapy can be used to augment the effect of hypothermia as an anti-cancer agent. So the, with the progress of science and understanding, appropriate use, appropriate use will emerge, I think. The effect of hypothermia enhancer, which can enhance the effect of hypothermia, both in the local region or immune augmenter or other immunotherapy agent are still well understanding. But I think, we are in the right direction. Introducing hypothermia as a definite armamentarium of cancer treatment is going to benefit all the other treatment and the patient in the end. We're talking about hypothermia. Hypothermia is a single agent, can be treated, but there is not hypothermia really, you know, if you're just cauterizing. Small cancer can be cauterized completely, skin cancer particularly, not anywhere else. But also, if you think of radiosurgery, small tumors which 
were actually using radio surgery to to cure it. It is basically where we're coagulating and the treatment is is partly with hypothermia and radiation. And then hypothermia can be used concurrently with chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Hypothermia can be used concurrently with radiotherapy. And hypothermia can be used perioperatively before before surgery and after surgery. And also during surgery, during the COVID, I would just try to understand why it can be effective during surgery. Or it may be deterrent. It may be bad to be hypothermia during the COVID treatment, but the benefits pre and post is enormous. So the, the use of uh, treatment of can cancer is rising. Temperature, what you understand, we have to understand that what happens the uh, when you heat the body. The heating uh, temperature, body's temperature rising is a defense mechanism. And that defense mechanism is one of the way it works is by immuno augmentation. So there is nothing spectacular or nothing un unusual that hypothermia will have an effect on all diseases, including cancer. But on the other hand, practically or in a way we call, uh, we specify cancer treatment, hypothermia cannot uh, on its own treat cancer. If it, it significantly enhances the action of radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and immunotherapy agents, we'll explain how it does uh, shortly uh, against cancer. And it can be used with, with total body radio, total body hypothermia, or sexual hypothermia, and or regional hypothermia. The equipment that are available can, can are available to keep total body or sexual hypothermia, that's the machine you can see there, and also regional hypothermia. A total body hypothermia costs nearly 1.2 million, is far less than a linear accelerator. And Again, uh, it is must is very cost effective, and the regional hypothermia cost hypothermia unit costs only half a million USD. But the costs are coming down as we start to use this modality more and more. So, how does it work? Hypothermia, how the, how is it? it is common sense. I I even a great club boy will understand what happened with the when you heat the tumor, what happened with the macro environment and how it works in this auxiliary environment. It enhances in, in macro environment, we'll talk about it, in, in the subcellular uh, interaction, it therapeutically enhances all the anti neoplastic agents. It, it, it also physiologically to protect the system with immune augmenter as an oncostatic agent, as a secondary support. So it just not only helps to cure cancer, but it also helps the body to protect from the side effects of cancer treatment. So just the sit down and think what happens in the in mac in macrobiology sense. It increases blood blood supply. Of course, when, when you heat up your body, you, you get burned, it gets red. That means there's more ex extra blood supply. Extra blood supply means extra oxygenation. Extra oxygenation means uh, reduced hypoxia. When there's reduced hypoxia, the cells start to cycle those because hypoxia cells are in hyper hibernating phase with increased oxygenation, they start to cycle. And when the cells start to cycle, then more uh, uh, sensitive to both radiation and chemotherapy. As a result, there is more cell kill and higher uh, uh, tumor response. At the microbiology level and at some cell level, it inhibits heat, it inhibits DNA repair both with radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And it has other multiple metabolic effects of heat with the, the heat shock to HSP. It is very complex, it's getting we're understanding, we're knowing more and more, every day almost. But we are actually in the right path to discovering the how hypothermia can be used properly and very effectively to enhance the other oncolytic agents. And so because HSP, uh, it's a protein increases cell death due to induction enhanced apoptosis. There's one thing, only one thing. 
we know many other things. And you know, that does it immunizes, it enhances radiation, chemotherapy, and immunosynthesis. One important thing is with hy hyperemia, the anemia is a biggest enemy for all oncology except surgery. All oncologic chemotherapy and radiation. When there's anemia, lack of lack of hemoglobin, lack of oxygen, radiotherapy doesn't work, chemotherapy doesn't work. Lack of oxygen uh, because the cells are in, in sleeping phase or um phase, it does not work. So by combating anemia by increasing the blood flow, that is another huge, huge benefit by using hyperthermia as a part of cancer treatment. So this is uh, what happens when we give hyperthermia. This is not a very complex thing. What are the how it oh, how it works as a radio sensitor. It inhibits hyperthermic, inhibits DNA repair. It improves tumor oxygenation. It uh, reduces hypoxic cells or sensitizes with it. And then intrinsically heat sensitive tumors, there's some, some tumors are intrinsically heat sensitive compared to other tumors like there are no and sarcoma. The same heat, will kill maybe certain amount of more uh, sarcoma melanoma cells than squamous cells. Then S phases, when the cells are cycling, S phases are most sensitive to heat. And when we add, I know, we know that S phases are sensitive to chemotherapy, when we add heat to the S phase, then there'll be more cell kill. And again, in, in the blood flow, and that's how the, the simplistic way of explaining how it works, hyperthermia works uh, for while we're actually treating cancer. And then we, uh, what happens also the hyperthermia, and the vascularity it, in, in, in microscopic level or molecular level, it, it reduces HSP, uh, which reduces exosomes, then it activates the NK cells, then it also activates the den dendritic cells, and then they it also the uh, transfer the antigens and dendritic cell to the uh, to the climbing cell. Then the NK cells is lyses lyses the cancer cell. That's how it works with hyperthermia alone. But when we when they work together with chemotherapy radiation, the these were they these are all almost common things for all these. But the hyperthermia enhances, but the temperature must be between 39 and 45 degrees centigrade. That is the, that window, uh, the therapeutic window we have that when we get the best benefit of hyperthermia. But nowadays they're telling us that the biologists, you can increase the duration of hyperthermia with little less temperature. But I'm not quite sure about that, but we know for sure with many in my personal experience and in, in lab experience, Experiment have seen that 39 degree can certainly enhance the number of blood vessels, can enhance the size of the blood vessels, and we can also enhance the flow of blood within the tumors, tumor, uh, tumor tissues. And also now we're using nanoparticles. And the interesting thing is when we use nanoparticles, metal, 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 metal based nanoparticles close to the tumor, then They'll take up hyperthermia and absorb it. And then we, that way, using nanoparticle is a hyperthermia enhancer. And that is coming soon. So that will be also another armamentarium of cancer treatment using hyper. As such, nanoparticle, I don't think has got uh, on its own, it is not an oncologic agent. But if we heat it up or we add it to chemotherapy or immunotherapy agent, it does work specifically and particularly as a target. Target, targeting agents. So this is a radio effect. You can see that how it is possible to uh, determine the iso hyperthermic dosimetry, how the hyperthermia is concentrating, focusing when you use multiple uh, fields like radiotherapy, it is possible to focus heat on a particular place. For example, cervix, we can increase the heat of uh, temperature of cervix by using multiple fields like radiation. So these are the results of using hyperthermia, 
competitive response of cancer treatment. Now you can see uh, that it, the, these are from German standard Hegel. They're showing that when we give only radiation and chemotherapy and mass stresses with radiation and chemotherapy plus hypothermia, the response rate is significantly better. In head and neck, from 42 to 78. From cervix, from 57 to 83. From prostate, no, prostate from 86 to 84. Every, every site these people have studied, there is a significant increase in response rate when we add hypothermia to uh, chemotherapy and radiation. The Japanese studies, and they're also showing that when we compare only radiotherapy with hypothermia radiation, almost all this, particularly you see the colorectal, there's a huge benefit of giving hypothermia locally uh, with radiation. The benefit is significant. But in all, head and neck, breast, lung, urinary bladder, the ones they reported, you see that there's significant benefit in almost all the sites where hypothermia is used with radiation as compared to radiotherapy alone. So we we, showed, we we know that there is an advantage of surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and immunotherapy. It has the clinical advantage, there's a response advantage, and when the response advantage, there is a survival advantage, and a, a long-term survival advantage, and when the long-term survival advantage, there's survival advantage.